it looks like we're approaching the official start time. I've got this horrible feeling that the way the system works is that I'm meant to be professional and know what I'm doing and therefore start on time. No one's going to tell me what to do, which is always disconcerting. Oh, more people arriving. Keep people just arriving. Welcome. There are very exciting free stickers, but I'm not going to be able to come down into the audience right now because I'm due to start, so make sure you get one before you go. They are the perfect Christmas gift. Okay. So, I think I'll start, if that's okay. As people are uh, taking their seats, I'll just pause briefly. Um, now, we'll start, I'll introduce myself. So, hi, um, again, thanks for coming, because I do know there are lots and lots of really interesting looking talks going on right now, and you've chosen to come to this one for some reason. Maybe you heard about the free stickers, and that was enough to get you in the room. Job done. Um, so I'm Martin, and I work for the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, who are the standards organization behind Bluetooth technology. So we don't make things, we're not a manufacturer, we're just concerned with specifications and evolution of the technology and so on. So I'm talking here about Bluetooth Mesh, with a bit of a nod to Zephyr, see a bit of code um, later on. I'm talking this afternoon about a much newer Bluetooth feature, which is radio direction finding and location services, that's at 2.25. So lots to cover, let's make a start. Just to get orientated then, um, there are kind of three main Bluetooth technologies now. So BREDR, that's basic rate enhanced data rate, that's the original Bluetooth. Bluetooth is like 20 years old now, which is quite remarkable. It's still around, though. It's great at streaming data from you know, one device to another, kind of device to device, point to point connection, used in audio quite a lot at the moment. Bluetooth Low Energy kind of can do the same things. It can do point to point connections, but it can also broadcast. So that's connectionless communication, something I'll mention later on in the context of Bluetooth Mesh. And of course, it's very power efficient. It's a low power wireless communication technology. That's the category. And then we have this thing called Bluetooth Mesh, the specification for which was released two years ago. It's not a wireless communication technology. It's a networking stack which uses Bluetooth Low Energy for radio communications. Talk more about that in a moment. I think there are something like 200 Bluetooth Mesh products certified now, which is actually huge in that sort of time period, um, relative to other things I've seen in the market with other technologies. So, press this button. Thank you. Naughty laptop wasn't behaving. There we go. So let's start um, here. It's kind of almost not valid now to talk about the Bluetooth stack because in fact there are several standard configurations of stack that we, we have in the spec. And, and the one on screen like right now is, is the one you have on your smartphones and in things like smartwatches and activity trackers and heart rate monitors and those kinds of kind of connectable Bluetooth devices. As always, the architecture breaks down into two major parts. We've got a controller, controller at the bottom. There are choices of controllers. That's the Bluetooth Low Energy controller. In this case, takes care of stuff, like inter interfaces directly with the radio, takes care of analog things to, um, such as modulation schemes, blah, blah, blah. And then the other major uh, architectural component is called the host. In this case, you can see layers from the Bluetooth stack which enable communication and interaction with those connectable devices like activity uh, trackers. Who's worked with Bluetooth low energy maybe on, on projects? So quite a few of you uh, are already familiar with terms like GAT and GAP and APT. These are acronyms from that variant of the Bluetooth stack. So that's what you do have on devices like phones. What you don't have, though, is this variant of the stack. This is Bluetooth Mesh. So all of the Bluetooth Mesh um, stack layers live inside the host, and there they are depicted on screen. If you're a stack developer, you're interested in all of them, and you will need to read the spec. If you're a developer who creates firmware for products, then you're probably mostly interested in the very top of the stack. You'll be working with things called models. Talk more about that in a moment. Importantly, down at the bottom of the stack, we have bearers, and they define how Bluetooth Low Energy's controller is used for radio communication. And then there's a couple of different bearers defined today with possibilities for the future to do other things. Some mesh devices have both these stack variants, and we'll see that hopefully later on. 
So I want to start you off kind of assuming that it's a new subject for you with some basic concepts, starting with some sort of network level things, some terminology, and kind of network level behaviors. So three words all start with multi, so you know, remember that for the test that follows, uh, multi-hop, multi-path, and multi-cast. Everything's message oriented, so devices communicate with each other by sending messages. There are lots of types of messages, they're all in a spec as you'd expect. But messages can travel right across the network far further than radio range would normally suggest. So normally we're constrained by the range that our radio has for wireless communication. But in a mesh network, messages hop across the network from device to device to device, a process called relaying, which I'll talk more about in a moment. So that gives us enormous coverage. We can have big networks containing up to 32,000 plus devices, covering very large areas, whole buildings, buildings like this one, collections of buildings, maybe even neighborhoods. I know someone working on a project looking at Bluetooth mesh uh, in a neighborhood context. So that's multi-hop, gives us very, very wide uh, coverage. You can do up to 127 hops, by the way, and the point-to-point -point range between devices is far larger than you perhaps think it is. If you look at Bluetooth.com today, you'll see we've got a thing going on looking to dispel myths about Bluetooth and range. It's not 20 meters, it's over a kilometer these days, okay? Not saying you'll get that uh, in a building, but the basic building blocks relating to range are very, very positive, very healthy with Bluetooth these days. So we can do up to 127 hops, but you can control that. You wouldn't want all your messages traveling all the way across the, the, uh, the network, so you can con configure kind of maximum number of hops, and you can control that from code as well. If I was controlling, I was programming a switch to control all of the lights in this room, they're almost certainly all in direct range. So I actually don't want any hopping to take place at all, so I can make sure that that's the case. Oh, sorry. So that was multi-hop. Uh, Multi-path actually is about reliability. Um, like any networking technology, you kind of have to do some thinking about network design. It's not too hard, to be honest, with a Bluetooth mesh network. But one of the things you'll do is think about um, reliability. And with, with not a great deal of brain power required, your network will work such that without any extra effort on the part of the developer and without centralized complex routing tables, multiple copies of every message sent will travel via different paths through the network to the destination devices that are being targeted, okay? So this gives us kind of redundancy. One of those paths is broken, not a problem, because one of the other copies will make it through one of the other paths to its destination. And when duplicates arrive, the first is acted upon, the rest just get ignored, okay? Multicast means exactly what it always means. This is about one device addressing multiple devices. Actually quite a complex engineering problem in the world of wireless communication. Um, read RFC, and I'm looking at my notes here, 3170, because I can never remember the number, 3170, that's IP multicast applications. It's got nothing to do with Bluetooth, but it does lay out some of the problems to do with multicast communication really, really nicely. Uh, and Bluetooth takes a really interesting approach to multicast communication in mesh networking, and in fact, it's kind of assumed that all operations are multicast, apart from a, a small number. The entire system's built around this idea. Multicast communication gives you immense scalability. Your probably number one constraint in scaling a wireless mesh network concerns how efficiently or otherwise you use the radio spectrum, how long you're occupying a frequency for, such that some operation is initiated in the network. Okay, so big messages transmitted slowly are gonna occupy a frequency for a long time and stop other devices from communicating during that time slot. Small, highly optimized messages transmitted quickly through the air with a very fast symbol rate which Bluetooth has. Um, and addressing multiple devices all in one hit, that's how you get best scalability. One tiny message to control all the lights in this room. So that's about scalability. We talk about individual devices now. So devices that are members of our network, in terms of terminology, we call them nodes. I'll tell you how they become a member later on. And we don't really have any special kind of black box networking devices defined or needed in the world of Bluetooth mesh. There are some special roles that devices can have, providing network services of various sorts within the network, but it's all software. So in principle, any device running a Bluetooth mesh stack 
through configuration can be told, we want you to have this particular special role in the network, please. Four of them, and the first one I've kind of hinted at already, and that's the relay. So that multi-hop capability, where we hop across the network, that's a consequence of devices acting as relays. And actually, so is multi-path. All the relay does is it will receive any mesh communication going on that's in range of it, in terms of radio range, and it will repeat it. It'll broadcast it again. If I've got two relays, different ends of this room maybe, that are in range of every transmitting device in this room, they'll both retransmit the messages they receive, and that's how we get multipath. It's really, really simple, but very effective. The point is we don't need routing tables to be centrally maintained and replicated across the network and fixed when they break, which is how some other things do it, and it's a whole world of complexity. One issue with relays, some of you probably are already thinking, is that given the importance of looking after our finite radio spectrum, relays, of course, repeat things that they hear, so they're going to use some of your radio spectrum, so you don't have too many of them. Rough rule of thumb, 5% of your nodes are probably going to be relays, but you have to figure that out on a case-by-case -case basis. Too many, it's not going to scale well. You kind of create a little storm if you're not careful. Next two roles kind of work together. Um, we've got things for low power nodes and friends. Again, this is a configuration flag you switch on on devices that you choose. The point here is that some devices are going to be kind of very power poor. Maybe they run off batteries. Others will be what we call power rich. They're connected to the mains, to the grid. Power availability, not a problem. The power poor devices, in some situations, not relating to Bluetooth mesh, maybe we don't have to worry about that too much because they only use the radio, which is what uses our power occasionally. They transmit a message twice a year. We're not generally worried about devices like that, but in the context of Bluetooth mesh, we still are because even those devices need to be able to receive messages from across the network. There are system messages flowing around the network from time to time, for example. Consequently, the radio has to be on in receive mode some proportion of the time such that messages can be received, and that's going to use power. So it's seemingly a dilemma. How do we take a power-efficient approach to power-poor devices that are perhaps battery-powered? And the answer comes through this thing called friendship. I kid you not, that is the technical term. It's in the spec. So you, in setting up your network, will designate some devices as low-power nodes and some as friends, meaning devices that are not power poor and can lend some assistance to the low power nodes. And the stack defines a protocol whereby when you first switch on your low power node, it can dynamically discover nodes that are friends and which are in range. They have a little conversation, establish a relationship called friendship, and after that point, the two work together with the friend doing the heavy lifting. The low power node goes to sleep, its radio is now off, using next to no power, doing whatever it, it needs to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then any messages that need to be delivered to the low power node, in this case I've got a sensor, actually get delivered to the friend where they're stored for safekeeping. And according to some frequency you configure, maybe once a day, the low power node's going to wake up, switch its radio on, use the protocol to send a message to its friend to say, have you got any messages stored for me? stay awake, now in receive mode, those messages get delivered back. And I go back to sleep again. So that's how low power nodes and friends work together so that power can be efficiently used. So our last role is called the proxy. And I kind of hinted at proxies earlier on, because proxies, excuse me as I walk away from the microphone and keep talking, proxies, um, are the type of Bluetooth mesh device that have both of those stack variants that I showed you at the beginning on them. They both support the world of GAT, GAP, and the attribute protocol, which our connectable devices use, which your smartphones support, which my laptop supports, and so on. And they have a mesh stack on them as well. A bit more memory needed, but they are dual role. And consequently, proxy nodes, which can either be dedicated devices, or it could be something convenient like a light, can provide a kind of interface from one version of Bluetooth to the other, and in fact, there's a, a protocol called the proxy protocol that lets me encapsulate mesh network PDUs inside these proxy things which I can write to my proxy device. 
it unwraps them and relays them into the mesh network, and vice versa. If you're familiar with Bluetooth notifications, mesh messages will be turned into notifications by your proxy and delivered to the connected Bluetooth device, your smartphone, your laptop, or whatever. Sometimes we need graphical user interfaces as part of our mesh network, not tiny microcontroller stuff. We need people to be able to monitor and control systems in industry, in smart buildings, or, or wherever our network has, has been deployed. So communication interaction, again, already hinted at some of this stuff. Again, it's all message oriented. So there are several specifications, uh, three in total actually, that cover the entirety of Bluetooth mesh. One of them defines things called models, which I'll come on to, messages and states. So states are data items that have names, take certain values, reflect some aspect of a device. Messages act upon those state values. For, so for every state type that there is in the spec, there are at least, or well, there are four message types defined. The four types are set, which of course lets me change a given state in one or more remote devices. So the simplest example is on-off. There's a state called generic on-off. If I send a set message, a generic on-off set message, I can change the state of remote target devices from off to on, from on to off. Simple stuff, right? There are get messages which let me query the state of remote devices, and they will reply with a status message that contains that value. You can send status messages anytime you want just to report your state and so on. So that's three, but in fact there are two types of set message, which gives us our four, because we have acknowledged set messages. If I send one of those, I'm gonna get a reply to confirm it was received and acted upon. That reply is a status message. But I also have set unacknowledged messages where I send my message and I get no reply. Now, I'm fairly sure everyone who's ever worked with a protocol has worked with a request re response style protocol. That's the most common form that they are from HTTP onwards. So you might assume that that's what we use in Bluetooth mesh, but in actual fact it's not. It's rare that you use acknowledged messages. Generally speaking, you're gonna use unacknowledged messages. And as briefly as I can, here's the reason. Complexity grows very, very rapidly in mesh networking, especially with multicast operations. If I flick a switch on the wall to switch all the lights in this room on, for example, I don't know how many lights there are in here, let's say there are 50, and I send an acknowledged message, I will get 50 acknowledgements back, assuming all those messages are received and acted upon the first time around. That's, you know, immediately, that's a spike in traffic. Of course, I might not receive responses from all of them, so I'm gonna have to have some time out processing now while I wait. I'm also gonna need to know the identities of every device that I expected to respond to that message. So that's information I have to have somewhere. Hmm, okay, getting a bit more complicated. And having realized after my 10 second timeout window or whatever that three of them didn't reply, I now need some kind of retry logic. And the same, it kind of repeats itself. So very quickly, complexity scales, and we start to eat bandwidth really quickly. You can generate storms very, very quickly indeed if you're not careful. Read that RFC, which is not about Bluetooth, but it's, it talks about all this stuff. So we take a different approach, because one of the kind of subject headings here is reliability. How do I know it worked? Well, you don't have to know that it worked. What you have to do is take steps to ensure that it almost certainly does. Wireless communication, that's the best you can ever ha hope for, almost certainly, okay? There's always gonna be a probability that communication fails. Someone could have half a dozen microwave ovens switched on with the door open, saturating the, that part of the radio spectrum. You might find your stuff doesn't work anymore, okay? So, we take a probabilistic, is that how you say it? Probabilistic, stochastic, I can say that, kind of approach to reliability here, and low down in the stack at the network layer, you can configure your device to send the same message handed from higher in the stack multiple times, maybe two times, maybe three times, in rapid succession, maybe with 20 or 160 millisecond uh, gaps between them. And here's what that does. Imagine, and these are not real numbers, but imagine the probability of my message not being received is 0.01%, because usually they are, but there's a small probability. Consequently, the probability that the original message 
and the duplicate follow, it's followed by very quickly, uh, also not being received, is 0.01 squared. Ooh, small number now. If I send two duplicates, it becomes a really small number. And all we're looking for really is a kind of fit for purpose degree of reliability. Think about availability figures for, for big systems. We used to talk about five nines availability in the world of high availability systems, blah, blah, blah. Never entirely sure how anyone ever proved this stuff, but that's, that was the mindset, and the mindset, I suppose, is sim similar here. But this is a simple approach that's effective. I'm going to do a demonstration later. It's called the kiss of death, <laughs> saying all these things. Uh, effective and doesn't consume loads of bandwidth. So states acted upon by messages is where we got to. There's an addressing scheme. So each device has a unique address, as you'd expect, but we hardly ever use them, OK? There are also group addresses that identify collections or sets of devices. Those are the ones we use, even when we think there's only one member in that set. We use a publish and subscribe system. This means that sending devices know nothing about the recipients of their messages. I refer the learned audience back to my comments earlier about complexity and managing acknowledgements and stuff. You need to know who's receiving your messages. We don't, okay? When I configure my light switch, I'm gonna use lighting as an example because we all know about lighting. I'm gonna say, when the button's pressed, you're gonna transmit or publish a message to this group address. Meanwhile, when I set up all of my lights through a process called provisioning and configuration, they will be subscribed to that same address. All that means is that they will listen and respond to messages with that address on them. They don't know where they're coming from. They have no idea whether 10 switches might send those messages to that address or just one. They're completely decoupled, which is great because I can make changes without having to reconfigure, change loads of things, maybe wait overnight for tables to rebuild. There's one mesh networking technology that does that. Not good, okay? Bad enough in a domestic uh, context, but this is really for big commercial buildings. You can't have that. Uh, hotels can have tens of thousands of lights. So that's how addressing works. Let's look a bit more closely at nodes. Slightly concerned about time. So nodes are things, devices that are members of our network, but nodes can have more than one addressable part, and we call those things elements. And again, every device does have a unique address. It's a 16-bit number. That address belongs to the element or elements your node has. Now, sitting inside each element, we have things called models. Models are actually standard software components, standard in the sense that they're defined by our specification. They do one thing. They take care of one type of operation, handling on offs, changing levels, changing colors, those sorts of things. That's what models define. They define the behaviors, the message types associated with them, and the states that represent the various conditions associated with that aspect of the device. There's an example, so we've got a big kind of LED unit there. That would be one node in my network, but it's got three elements because the individual LEDs are individually controllable. Okay, makes sense? So in my code, I'm going to have some sort of structure that defines my node and the fact that it has three elements and that each element implements two particular uh, models. Uh, in this case, I've got the generic on-off server model. Yes, we have clients and servers. Clients don't have any state values. They just send messages. Um, servers contain state. But I've also got the light lightness server model because that's to do with brightness control and, and my LEDs are dimmable. So as a kind of firmware developer working with product management, you're, you're looking at equipping products with certain behaviors. Those behaviors are a consequence of the models the device has which you will either implement in code or, or your vendor will have implemented them for you and you'll just be adding the device-specific stuff in response to messages that model um, has associated with it. So security, absolutely no time to talk about this subject properly. It's at least two or three um, presentations in its own right, but here's a summary. Take a device out of the box that you just bought from Amazon or some other shop. Um, it's not a member of your mesh network. It's just a thing, a device. To turn it into a member of your network, you go through a process called provisioning, which usually involves a smartphone application or something like that. What actually happens is you equip over a secure communication channel the new device with a number of security keys, one of which is called the network key. Possession of that key is what makes it part of your network, okay? There are other keys as well I'll kind of come on to in the next slide. 
So that's provisioning, analogous to pairing, but it isn't pairing. Imagine if you had to pair every member of your 32,000 node network with every other member of your 32,000 node network. It would take quite a long time, so new process called provisioning. Some bullet points on security to tax my technical knowledge and public speaking skills. But number one, it's mandatory. With the other Bluetooth stuff that um, was on the, the stack diagram earlier on, it's not mandatory. It's up to manufacturers to decide what security features they use for their products because they understand it and the context it's used in and the threats. Bluetooth mesh is mandatory, so everybody has to do the same thing. You can't have one device coming in with weak security and ruining the security of the whole network. All messages are encrypted and authenticated. That's AES CCM. Um, we've got separate sets of security keys that encrypt network layer related fields in PDUs and application layer PDUs. So in the context of a Bluetooth mesh network, an application is anything you want it to be, but it's things like lighting, air conditioning, heating, again, smart building examples here, you decide and you make devices part of applications by giving them appropriate application keys that you've created during the whole setup process. You can do things like um, area isolation, quite like this one. So with different subnet keys, you can kind of draw cryptographic boundaries around physical areas. So think about rooms in hotels. You can issue different network subnet keys for different rooms. You know, when you check in, your phone gets issued with some stuff. You can control the smart devices in your room, but not the devices in the room next door, hopefully. That's, that's the idea. Um, all messages have some header stuff that's not encrypted, has to stay that way, but we do obfuscate it so that any kind of, uh, you know, kind of pattern analysis to try and track kind of patterns of behavior, maybe track people in the network, won't work, very difficult to do thanks to that obfuscation. There's a uh, protection against some of the standard things like replay attacks, trash can attacks, and so on. And it all derives from that first thing that you do, which is provisioning. That's how devices get their keys, and everything stems from there. <gasps> it's demonstration time. I've managed very uh, well to, to completely clear my mind of the, the horror of demonstrations. So I've got this thing. Let me quickly introduce it, because I'm really short of time now. 16 independent devices here with the Bluetooth module inside them running Zephyr. I'm assuming everyone knows what Zephyr is, open source, embedded OS framework, whatever you want to call it, with a Bluetooth mesh stack and some associated APIs. So the mesh is doing all the uh, stack is doing all the things that it does. I've implemented the, the, the kind of models and I've implemented the gener generic on off server model because there are some LEDs I want to switch on and off and the light HSL server model. HSL, of course, is hue, saturation, and lightness. It's a color scheme. They're colored LEDs. I'd quite like to change the color of the LEDs. Um, this has got the generic on-off client on it, and it's got two buttons, one of which I've programmed to send generic on-off set unacknowledged brackets one, which means switch on, and the same bracket zero, which means switch off. And oh, look, it works. <laughs> okay, well, I'm pleased. <laughs> and press that one and they all go off. Now, in terms of addresses, every node in my network has been subscribed to three addresses because this is how I decided to, I wanted to do it. There's an address that every node has subscribed to, so that's a whole panel. And then each node subscribes to a distinct address for the column it's in and the row that it's in. So I'm transmitting here to the all panel address. What I've also got, and I've just realized I haven't switched it on, so I'm doing that now is a device that actually is only acting as a proxy. So in a way, it's a black box. And I'll quickly show you this, if I can. So this is a web application. You're looking at a web page here. I've used the Web Bluetooth JavaScript APIs. Hopefully, it's going to discover that thing. This always freaks me out, this part. There we go. So it's found my proxy, which, as far as it's concerned, is a Bluetooth device with the GAT, GAP, and at layers that we saw earlier on. I've just hopefully connected to it. I have. So now I can start injecting mesh messages um, into the network. And if you look at the top right there, DST, that's one of the fields in PDUs, destination address. By clicking around, I can change it. That's the all nodes address. Hey, Preston, there you go. And switch off. Um, if I click on a column, that's, that's boring, let's do that one. 
then only that column should respond, and it did. I click on a row. I can just switch on that row. So you can see how the publish and subscribe stuff works. And I can change colors, stay with that row. There we go. This is the light HSL server model, blah, blah, blah. Isn't that thrilling? I'm quite thrilled. I can tell that you are too. Disconnect, moving swiftly on. I think we've got a bit of a 20-minute buffer after my talk, actually, so maybe I'll just steal that. <laughs> So, joyous news, the demo worked. Let's look at code now. So obviously now this is straying out of my world, really. We're a standards organization. We don't define APIs or products or software, any of that kind of stuff. But um, I've mucked around with Zephyr quite a lot, I think is the, the right way of saying it. Um, and we have some educational resources that we've based on Zephyr, kind of like a lot about it, um, not least of which is the fact that it's hardware agnostic, you know, it, it, you can build for lots and lots and lots of different boards. I want to say about 200, someone in the audience, correct me, is it around 200 now, anyone? Not looking at anyone in particular? Thank you, someone gave me a thumbs up to so loads of different boards, different hardware manufacturers supported. We are like Switzerland, we have no favorites, so this works well in terms of my uh, kind of diplomacy. Just give you a sense of what coding looks like here. So if we start here, this is this uh, kind of node composition stuff. And if you look at the code from the bottom up, I've got, so you've got lots of um, data types and structs and macros that you work with in Zephyr. So at the bottom here, I'm defining essentially my, my node. So this is kind of the kind of root of my node composition hierarchy. And it's saying that my node consists of an array of elements. And if we look at the ele elements array above it, I've defined actually only one element. So I've got a single element. There's only one addressable part in each of these devices. That element, though, comprises a list of an array of models. And if we go to the models array above it, you'll see that I'm using various macros to define models. Now, there are some system models defined in the spec. We call them foundation models. There's the configuration server model. That's what lets you configure your device. And there's the health server model, which is about fault reporting. And then there's other stuff for which we have a macro called BT mesh model. And you can probably see there I've defined the generic on off server model and the generic level server model. Now, all well and good, but I need to map message op codes that uniquely define individual message types to functions that will handle them, which is partly what I'm doing with the highlighted reference in that code. So if we move on to the next slide there, you'll see that I've got some constants defined, again using some nice macros. You can see that message op codes are 16-bit values. Again, you get all the numbers from the spec. Uh, and then sitting underneath that, for particular model highlighted on the previous slide, I've listed functions which must be called if we receive a message with this op code. So that's how we kind of route inbound messages by op code and model to functions which then responds to them. And this is where it gets implementation specific, because you now need to decide what it is you're going to do uh, in response to receiving that message. So we have various nice Zephyr APIs available to us. Um, your stuff arrives in a network buffer, so you're going to use the network buffer APIs. You're going to have the Bluetooth um, mesh models specification open at page whatever, so you can see the message structure. You'll use the network buffer APIs to take fields according to their size and type, out of the network buffer. And once you've got them set up in variables, you then initiate some work to respond. And I've used uh, a worker so I don't block the main thread to, to get that done. Sending messages is pretty much the same, but in reverse. So I'm going to populate a network buffer with the fields that my message must contain to be a valid mesh message. And again, I'm consulting the spec to know what that means. So I'm creating a network buffer at the bottom of the slide there and then I'm populating it with some messages down at the bottom with uh, things like netbuff simple add u8, unsigned 8-bit integer down, down at the bottom there. We've also got a context that we need to define, which has various parameters in it. If you can read at the back, we've got netidx and appidx. These are actually indexes to various security keys which I've registered in code you haven't seen. I could have lots of different security keys for lots of different applications lots of different subnets, I have to say which ones I want to be used to encrypt the different parts of my PDU. So I'm saying that there in my context. I'm also setting the destination address for my 
message and TTL is the name of the field which controls how many hops maximum will do across the network. If I know nothing's more than, more than one hop out of, out of range, then when I configure my switch, I'm going to say, you know, by default, set TTL to two to one, so you only do one hop. And what I'm saying in the code there is, is, is use the default, it's fine, but I could override it in my code if I wanted to. Maybe there's some conditional stuff that I wanted to, to do. So that's sending messages. Oh, and there's the actual send message there. Sorry, out in my last slide on that subject. BT mesh model sends, brackets some parameters, message sent. The kind of the whole point here is not to kind of absorb the detail. It's hopefully to go, oh, that looks quite easy because it's quite rational, quite, there's a learning curve regarding some of the concepts, but putting it into practice isn't hard. And Zephyr ships with loads of samples for all sorts of things, including all supported flavors of Bluetooth, which of course in, includes mesh. So there's some good stuff in there to help you get started. That said, it's not your only source of information because we've got some stuff as well. So our website is www.bluetooth.com, which I'm sure you can all remember. Highly recommend it. If you click on resources, then study guides, that's the term we use for um, developer resources, which I shall come on to in a moment. But we've got some papers picked out a couple for you here. One is the Bluetooth mesh networking intro for developers. It's sort of the stuff I've been talking about, but more. It might look like it's 20 odd pages, but I think mostly it's pictures. I think in reality, it's like eight pages. You'll read it on the train in half an hour and it's like, oh, okay, pretty good place to start. The mesh models technical overview focuses specifically on models. Like what models do we have? What have we defined? What do I need to know to understand them? You just read the bits that make you know, are, are of interest to you. Ultimately, you've got to read the spec though, or at least parts of it. That's where you absolutely have to go. This should make it easier. If you want hands-on practice, two things. We've got the uh, Bluetooth Mesh Developer Study Guide is what we call it. That's the one on the left. Click on, again, Resources Study Guides. You'll see it there. We'll do some coding, a whole series of projects, all based on Zephyr. Slightly out of date, the Zephyr actually, which I need to update. Guilty conscience forcing me to confess to you all there, but I'll get to that, I promise. Um, and there's also a resource specifically about the proxy function, which I use to make my web Bluetooth application. And in fact, all the code for that demo is in there. I'm being bombed by an insect here. Um, all the code for that demo application is there and also an iOS smartphone application, which does the same thing. So lots of stuff to help you make progress up the learning curve with Bluetooth mesh. And that, my friends, slightly out over time, aren't I a terrible human being, but I did give you a sticker. Um, is it from me? Um, thank you very much for, for listening. I don't know if we have time for questions. Let, let's do questions unless somebody tells us to stop. Shall we do that? Yes. I don't know. I've got no idea how this, this works, but I'm happy to repeat the questions. Or you could come up here. Yeah. Come up here. Uh, uh, what is the current support of Bluetooth Mesh in upstream Linux kernel, if you know? Oh, um, I'm going to say it's partially supported, but I'm not good to answer this question. However, I do happen to know somebody in the audience who probably absolutely does know. Um, without wishing to single him out, would anyone like to volunteer an answer to that question that's better than mine? Johan. <laughs> I won't walk up there, I'll just take one. So uh, we have uh, support in Bluetooth, basically, it doesn't require any updates. Uh, from the terminal currently. Okay. But uh, the limitation that comes with it is that it's purely for mesh that you use your Bluetooth partner in that case, so you cannot mix it with any other Bluetooth application okay. currently. We have long-term plans to support both like existing Bluetooth applications together with Mesh, and that will require some changes to the kernel, but that's uh, on the to-do list. Uh, okay. See, wasn't that a good answer? <laughs> See, I, I knew he was going to be here, Thank and you. secretly we arranged this whole thing. It's good to have someone in the audience who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone else got a question? Who knows? I might know the answer. Might not. Yeah, at the back. All right. No, it wasn't. So, the moving parts in this demo. Is that on screen? It's not on screen at the moment. Um, Yeah, so the moving parts here is I have a web page, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, like always. That happens, so I could have, no, actually, I couldn't have uh, opened it from the file system. I have a local uh, web server, okay? 
I'm using an API which is not supported by all browsers. It's Google are driving it, so it's in Chrome on everything except iOS, and it's in Samsung's browser, and it might materialize in, in Microsoft browser, brow at Microsoft's new browser soon. It's called Web Bluetooth. So it's not for mesh, it's for those other types, those other categories of Bluetooth devices, lets me discover, connect to, and then interact with connectable devices, of which this is one. So this is a Zephyr device, and it's got both of those stat variants on it. So as a kind of connectable Bluetooth device, it's advertising, that's broadcasting packets to say, hello, I am here, and this is what kind of device I am. The advertising packets actually include a uh, 16-bit ID that says I'm a mesh proxy. So my web Bluetooth app, app is scanning for those packets, finding them. That's the first thing I did when I clicked the button at the top. I'm currently connected already. Once I've formed that connection, in my code, which uh, I've, you know, I won't show you because we'll get kicked out of the room in a moment, um, I am creating mesh network PDUs. I am encrypting them in the required way using some JavaScript APIs. My application has the network and application keys. It's been provisioned manually, by which I mean, in this case, I hard-coded them. Yes, I'm a bad person. You wouldn't do that in real life. You can see them in my, if we do show source, what have you, you'll, you'll see my security keys there, so that's not how you do it, but it's a demo. And then I'm wrapping what is essentially a byte array with some encrypted parts in another layer of protocol called the proxy protocol, and I'm writing it to my proxy device. There's a write operation supported by GAT, and proxy devices will take the contents of GAT writes, unwrap the proxy PDU layer, take out the mesh networking PDU, and relay it. That's how that works. So no web server in here, hope that made sense, but the code's available. Anyone else, do I have to stop yet? Yes. Could you repeat that, please, a bit louder? Uh, can I know the uh, friend and the relay at the same time? Yes, it can, yes. So of the four roles, you can be all four or none, or anything in between. It's a software configuration flag, subject to implementation limitations. Some devices won't allow you to. Proxies need more memory, for example. So I did try to, um, try to make a proxy out of one of these things once, and they have 16K RAM, and I, I, it didn't work. I couldn't do it. So. Aside from implementation um, constraints, yes, you can have multi-role nodes. Anyone else? Yes? What are limits regarding local power consumption and limits regarding network congestion? Yes and no. So the question was about limits regarding power consumption or um, network congestion. So now we're outside the spec. We, we don't specify anything about power consumption. That's an implementation issue. Um, so really, you need to look at you know, products or modules from vendors to, to really get a good answer to that question. Um, yeah, that's probably the best I can give you on that one. Network congestion, there's some benchmarking data available. I think Ericsson did a load of benchmarking, uh, which you'll find on our websites. Um, I've done some, but only with small networks, sort of 64 nodes. I, did some stuff with, um, but that's all I've got. Um, I have to say, anecdotally, um, my impression is that Bluetooth mesh scales way beyond the other kind of usual suspects. There are other low power mesh networking technologies. I'm not an expert in any of them, but anecdotally, because I get asked questions like, um, oh, we did some stuff with XYZ mesh networking technology, and we started to struggle when we had more than 10 devices. I'm like, Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pitiful. This was designed for commercial buildings in the first instance. Those are the large scale networks, as opposed to going smart home, residential sector, 10, possibly 11 devices to control. One is a thermostat, and then trying to make whatever you come up with work on large scale. And they did it the other way around. So I think it scales pretty well. So. Um, I'm feeling like I'm probably supposed to be stopping any moment now, but again, we'll keep going. Yes? Well, well, yes and no. So first of all, to be pedantic, which of course is our job as, as engineers, and um, there are no routers or even routers. So there are no things like that in a Bluetooth mesh network, and there is no routing. Okay, it's the relay process and the publish subscribe thing that, that yeah, I'm, forgive me, I know you know that, you were listening. Um, but can you buy 
certified, qualified Bluetooth mesh products, absolutely. So I was at, at an event in Paris in, I think it was February this year, and someone did a presentation on one of the other um, mesh networking technologies which is older than Bluetooth mesh. I'm not going to name it because I kind of don't like being mean about uh, the competition. Um, at that time, there were two qualified products for it, and it's older than Bluetooth mesh. We've got over 200 now, which might not sound a lot. The spec came out two years ago. People have to read it. They have to discuss with product management. They have to think about new products or impact on product roadmap, schedule engineering resources. Uh, eventually, stuff starts coming out. So stuff's coming out. I think it's growing. I always get mixed up. Is exponentially? Yeah, I think it's one of those words. Logarithmically? Yeah, I think it's exponential. That's that one. So they're sort of doubling every three months, I want to say. I think that's what we've been seeing. So it's growing quite quickly. Um, but, you know, as always, we'll see what happens. The market decides. Yes? I just wanted to add to that that uh, since a month ago or so, the long-term support release of Zephyr has Mesh as a uh, Bluetooth qualified subsystem. So Good point. Use that as a building block for building qualified uh, Mesh products. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. So in a sense, despite being new in the context of standardization processes, which can be quite lengthy, it's actually maturing very quickly, I think it's fair to say. I think people are coming in for the next talk and I'm still here, so I'm gonna stop now, if that's okay with you guys. Thanks for the questions, um, but I'm not disappearing. If you wanna talk more, I'll lurk outside until it seems I don't need to lurk anymore. Thank you again, cheers.